I'm going to let the host of Truth Be Told, the incredible Tanya Mosley, introduce the show and the guests. Okay, I want to let you in on something. In 2019, I created Truth Be Told as an experiment. I wanted to see if we could create a space within public radio that centered our experiences in a way that felt truer than journalism or news. Black and brown folks in conversation with each other for the benefit of each other. KQED in San Francisco gave me that opportunity. And before my producers and I even turned on a mic, we sat down with community in places like San Francisco and Oakland and Detroit to find out what you wanted in a podcast that would be for us and by us. We got down D-School style, charting out what a show like this could look and sound like. And what you shared with us was clear. What you needed, what you yearned for, was a space where black and brown folks could use our collective experiences to learn and understand and heal together. Every step of the way, every topic, every idea, every piece of music we've used, we've had you in mind. And I can't overstate how therapeutic it has been for me to have you in mind. This show is the first time for me as a journalist that I have felt I am truly serving my people. Over five seasons, with the help of dynamic producers and creators, we've explored everything from how to find joy when the world is burning, dealing with workplace drama, liberation through sexual exploration, the radical act of rest, falling in love with our black bodies, letting go of family drama, and finding healing through psychedelic therapy. Tonight, we continue the conversation with some of my favorite wise ones. My therapist stops me and he says, how cruel is that? It had never occurred to me that it was cruel. It just occurred to me that it happened. Casey Gerald is the author of There Will Be No Miracles Here, a memoir that stands the American dream narrative on its head while straddling the complex intersection of race, class, religion, and sexuality. Casey was a wise one for season one of Truth Be Told, Family Ties. There Will Be No Miracles Here was named Best Book of the Year by NPR and the New York Times. Casey's two TED Talks have been viewed over five million times, and he opened for President Barack Obama at South by Southwest in 2016. He is at work on his next book, The Great Refusal. The assumption of all black women and girls is that the, the lives of black men and boys are a project in which we are to be invested, that we have work to do, that it matters. And I don't reject the project. It's the other part. It's the at all costs. Jamila was a wise one for season three of Truth Be Told, Obligation. She's a cultural critic and writer with a focus on issues of race, gender, and sexuality. Right now, she pins a weekly advice column for Slate's Care and Feeding parenting section and is a co-host for the publication's Mom and Dad Are Fighting podcast. Her first book, She Bad, Tales of Love, Hate, and Baby, is scheduled to be released in 2024. I um, had a lot of loss in my life. Friends, mentors, and I suffer from that African-American male thing of keep it moving. You know, like, yeah, it sucks, keep it moving. Like, you can't stop, you know, shark in the water. You know, you stop moving, you'll die. And so one of the things that psychedelics have done for me is given me a chance to slow down and to feel where the hurt has come in. Aize Jama Everett is an author, writer, theologian, and documentary filmmaker. He was featured in season five of Truth Be Told, where he discussed his relationship with plant medicines and the use of psychedelics to help treat racial trauma. In 2023, he produced a documentary called A Table of Our Own, which explores the use of plant medicines for healing. We can't forget that even the littlest ones can understand that they have a role. And if you can Absolutely. posit them and contextualize them in this crisis and say, yes, this is a horrible thing, but you're not helpless. You're lucky, you have us, you have this home, you have the opportunities, do not squander them. Nancy Red is an award-winning host and a New York Times bestselling author. Nancy was a wise one for season two of Truth Be Told, parenting during the pandemic. She's currently the host and producer of Mompreneurs, a video podcast for Madame Noir, which is in its second season. 
more often than not, particularly for the LGBTQ plus community, there's this re-traumatizing that constantly happens and this expectation that we're going to continue to put ourselves in the position of, again, being the teacher and then being hurt. I don't subscribe to that. And Stephen Canals is the Emmy nominated and Peabody award winning co creator, executive producer, director, and writer of the FX drama series Pose. He was a guest of season two of Truth Be Told, coming out while staying in. Steve is currently directing episodically for FX and Netflix while developing projects that center the voices and stories of historically marginalized, underrepresented communities under his Story Ave Productions banner. All right, we're taping tonight's conversation, so you'll be able to hear it back on our Truth Be Told feed. And I want you to take lots of pictures and post them under the hashtag TBT Live. You can also at us at our IG, at Dear TBT. And also get your questions together because after we're done with this conversation, we wanna hear from you. Okay, act one, Stephen Canals and Nancy Red. I wanna take this in for just a moment because I heard tonight was sold out and I tell you like the first thought I had when we were going to do this event was I hope like I know my husband will be there I know <laughs> like if my daughter doesn't have volleyball you know and so I'm just so happy that you all took the time on a Thursday in Los Angeles to come to Pasadena and sit with us for this beautiful conversation that we're going to have tonight so you got to be hyped because I have some amazing guests um, <laughs> As you heard, my first guests, Stephen Canals and Nancy Red, um, all of my wise ones for Truth Be Told um, have stuck with me in such a profound way. But tonight, I wanted to bring back folks um, that I wanted to continue a conversation with. You know, you only have 30 minutes or an hour with people on any given show at any given time. And so it's amazing when you can have slow down time. Um, and I know a lot of you all probably know me from Fresh Air. This is gonna be a little bit of a different conversation, okay? <laughs> so I just want to like make that clear, but we're all gonna have a great time and learn something. So we're breaking this night up into three acts. The first act is divesting from perfection and the myth that black exceptionalism will save us. Our second act is what do you do when you are so exhausted you can't even play the game anymore. And the third act is the black art of escape. But let's talk about divesting from perfection for a minute. Before we get deep into that discussion though, I know both of you all, um, you work in Hollywood, um, you work in writer's rooms, and right now, of course, we're all experiencing the strike. And so first, I just wanna ask how both of you all are doing, Nancy and Steven. Well, first, it's an honor to be here. And uh, one of the things that my husband and I learned a long time ago, because when we first came to Los Angeles, and with stars in our eyes, and we were very young, and it was 2008 that my husband booked uh, a movie, and right after that was the earlier strike. <laughs> so we learned a while ago to diversify your income. Right, right. <laughs> so it's kind of like being, I, I like to think of our entire existence in Hollywood as being like a, um, a prepper for yeah. the end of the world. We're constantly waiting for something to go wrong. So we have like 15 jobs between us. <laughs> so I'm devastated um, by what's happening and you can speak more to the direct impact. Um, but for us, um, we are fortunate to be temporarily sheltered, though who knows how long this will go. My husband's an actor, my children are actors. Um, I am also in SAG. Uh, so we are impacted and we are in solidarity, most importantly, because this is a very important strike. It's a historic strike, and it's one that I'm sure you can agree, we hope, will have an, an acceptable end. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cosine. Uh, the, the strike for me has been equal parts heartening and disheartening. Um, disheartening in that the industry has decided to um, step away from the creatives that have helped to line their pockets. Um, but heartening in that, particularly I think for me as a person of color, as a queer person navigating the industry, 
the truth is that the industry would have me believe that I am an exception and that I am the only. And being on those picket lines, I'm seeing a lot of folks who look just like me, mm. who have stories to tell just like I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, huh, that's funny. I thought there were two of us. Right. And yet here there are 2,000. Yes. And so, you know, I think for me, I take that away, that when, when this is finally done, when it's said and done, that there are so many of us yep. who are ready to tell our stories, you know, yeah. and we just need an opportunity. We just need the door to be open. We just need that investment. Yep. Man, you, you are the king of the segue because, <laughs> you know, I've been thinking so much about black exceptionalism and, and how, um, you know, it won't save us. And when you say that on its face, it's like, well, well what exactly does that mean? But I think all of us here on this stage come from a place where we had to work. We subscribed to that um, notion that you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. Mm -hmm. But you work twice as hard and you're like, okay, there is going to be like this rainbow at the end or there's going to be like light at the end of the tunnel and you get there and you realize, oh, this, you know, this is actually not it. I'm still, I'm still a black person in America, you know? I'm still dealing with all of the things I dealt with to get here. And I'm also realizing like life might be more than what this is actually giving. Nancy, I met you at NPR West, I think it was like two weeks before the pandemic. We had no idea what was going on. We had on. no idea. We were living our best life. <laughs> <laughs> but you were coming in to promote your book. You were on another show. And the moment I saw you, I know a perfectionist when I see one. I was like, OK, she's like one of us. She's one of me. And I was just um, really struck by, you're beautiful. You have a successful career. You have a wonderful family. Everything seems perfect for you. And then we got on the phone the other day. And I said, tell me what's on your mind. You know, we're going to be sitting on a stage. And you said, um, divesting from perfectionism. Tell me what led you to that realization in this moment that you're in. We don't have time for the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> but safe to say, after the past few years, raise your hand if you're just exhausted. You're just exhausted. And it really gives you an opportunity all of this time at home to really take stock of what matters. And then when you get back in the world and you're faced with a lot of the same stuff from before, you just don't have the patience for it. Mm -hmm. So a lot, we, we've talked a lot, and I'm sure you've talked a lot about how that comfort of home for those who have spent, those including myself and my family, who spend a lot of time being perfect, being being acceptable so we can get in the room and be that one, which again, asterisk, there's so many. <laughs> um, when you can just let it all hang out and be on the Zoom with no pants. And I, I like, <laughs> and like when I do my hair and my makeup, I don't have to put on four layers. I don't even have to take out the braids in my back. I just let out the front <laughs> and I'm good to go. And I put my bonnet right back on as soon as that Zoom is off. And then to get back in the world and try to do the, um, the, the, the dog and pony show that I did for so long was just very exhausting. And on top of that, a, a few very pivotal experiences happened to me um, in the last 18 months that I finally had to put big girl panties on and grow up. And, I, and these are things I couldn't perfectionist away. My mother became extraordinarily ill. Mm. And as we know, we've all had people in our life who've gotten ill and there's nothing you can do. There's no resume that will save that situation. There's no politeness and no lipstick shade that will overcome that hump. And so at the ripe age of 42, which we share many things in common, I learned that I, I have to be more realistic with myself and, and stop. Stephen, you said something really great in your Truth Be Told interview when it was about um, inviting people and, and, and bringing people to your space. And, and asking them if they're reticent about who you actually are is how well do you want to know me? Mm -hmm. Right, yep. And I loved that so much. And I think that when you're faced with perfectionism, it's important to ask a, one a question of themselves. How well do I want to know who I actually am? Yep. And that's been a difficult journey for me that I've kind of just begun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like really sitting in that space of you figuring out who am I really, 
For so many of us, what comes for me, I interviewed Tarana Burke, uh, the founder of the Me Too um, movement, and I read her book and like so much of it resonated with me so deeply. But then in our conversation, she just said very, very casually, you know, yes, because overachievement is a trauma response. It was such an obvious thing that it knocked me off my feet. And Stephen, I just want to know for you, when you hear that term, that, that overachievement is a trauma response, what does that bring up for you? When I was applying to UCLA's MFA program in screenwriting, we, there were a series of texts that we were required to, to read. And one of them is uh, Bird by Bird, written by Anne Lamont. Yeah. And there's, an, I, I don't, this isn't a direct quote, but she says some version of perfectionism is the language of the oppressor. And that's the first thing that comes to mind for me when I think of mm. what Tarana said to you. Say more about that. Well, I think that in my 42 years, <laughs> 43 in two weeks, um, Virgo. I, come on, Virgo, know all about perfectionism. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, what I have learned, though, in, in my 42 years is that perfectionism would have me believe that my best isn't good enough. And I've had to learn how to quiet that voice that has, is really just noise that tells me work harder. You know, that voice that says, what I've done that is really great, yeah. whether it is my investment in my relationships with people, whether it is my work on the page, whether it is my work behind the camera as a director, that my best isn't me phoning it in. My best isn't lazy. My best is my best, and yeah. that's good. Yeah. That's good enough. What got you there, though? I mean, you read that quote, but like that takes work to sit in that space when all your life you've been running in this way. Um, exhaustion and burnout. Yeah. You know, I think the reality is I'm, I'm hearing a lot of mm, so I'm sure everyone understands this is that I think perfectionism starts to eat away at you. You know, when I was 40, <laughs> 39, 40, um, I got really sick. Mm. You know, perfectionism impacted my body and I had to pay attention to what my body was telling me, which is to slow down and yeah. to take care of yourself. And that was really difficult because, as you pointed out, I think, especially working in an industry that is very white, very straight, very male, very cis, and I don't check a couple of those boxes, I have to be perfect, you know? I, like, I have to be 10 times better than my contemporaries. Yeah. Um, and the reality is that it takes a toll physically and mentally. Yeah. Um, and it's not worth it. Um, Nancy, though, do do you, you're in this space now where you're trying to divest from perfectionism. Do you feel fear, though, ar around not doing your best? Because I do. I mean, like, oh my gosh, like, I just have anxiety even thinking about, like, not going the extra mile. I have more fear of not giving this a shot because this is untenable. Mm. So I think what has happened in the last few years, and again, I, I, we were so symbiotic. We're like the same person with different lives. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> um, perfection, like, well, the, what I actually said to you on the phone was, which I came out of nowhere, like literally blurted it out, and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. I was like, perfectionism is what got us here, but it's also what's going to kill us. Yes. Um, and so, but isn't, but the complicated thing is, I'm proud of where I've gotten, and I'm grateful for uh, the, the fortune to get to be a perfectionist. Not everybody has the ability to, to spark that in them. They don't have the support system, they don't have the opportunities. Um, so I, I don't regret it. And so the idea that perfectionism, um, what, was, what did you say at the beginning? I believe you said the myth that perfectionism will, will, will save, will save us. us. Yeah, and I think it's a half myth. So, and, that's and black the, excellence The in black particular. excellence in particular. And it's complicated because black excellence of our, of our, of our forefathers and our ancestors is what, the, the, it, it, it killed them, right? It, like, we're, we're growing on the bodies of tons mm. and tons of black excellence. Mm. And without the black excellence behind us, we wouldn't even be able to be here. So I am giving it a shot. I'm only half-assing the lack of perfectionism. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Can I say, though, I don't, 
whether we're talking about black excellence or just excellence, I don't know that we we don't decide that though. I think it's decided separate and apart from us. Right. You know, immediately I think about my work on Pose, where it's like I was just creating a show. Yep. You know, other people put their investment and their energy and decided how important it is and decided to elevate it. I had nothing to do with that. That's kind and of like what we were talking about with Keith Herring um, earlier. You know, Keith Herring, Basquiat, all the people. Who decides what is What excellent? is good. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, in particular with Pose, the story behind even getting that made, I mean, it's it just so... I think you said something like, how many, how many folks did you meet with how many no's did you get? 161. Right. <laughs> yes. And it was one person who was your champion that actually made it happen for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, it, it was that one person, Sherry Marsh, who said, this is more than a sample. This is a show. We're going to get this made. Yeah. The thing about Pose, Pose um, at the time that it came out a few years ago was so tremendous. It was so groundbreaking. It was so nuanced and deep. It was just the perfect thing for the moment. And now several years later we're here. We're LGBT right, Q rights all across the country. We're fighting for it, they're being taken away. I just wanna know, are you feeling that shift in Hollywood? <laughs> I'll give you a little out, cause I'm feeling it in my day-to-day -day work. I think everyone in every industry is feeling a sea change. There have been incremental gains, for sure. I would never deny that. Um, I'll put it to you this way. On Pose, Michaela J. Rodriguez, Afro-Puerto Rican trans woman, was number one on our call sheet. Since the show has gone off the air, sitting here today, I cannot name another show where there is a black or brown trans woman who is number one on the call sheet. And so, sure, I could rattle off all of the stats that GLAD graciously compiles every year in their Where We Are on TV report, and I'll say, yeah, there have been gains. We're seeing more queer, trans, non-binary folks occupy space in television. And yet, that doesn't feel like it's enough for me. Yeah. You know, I, I have a hard time patting myself on the back when I think about the work that I did on Pose with all of my co-conspirators. When I look out at the television landscape and I'm not seeing a plethora of queer and trans narratives, Yeah. you know? We were kind of one of the only. And at this point, again, if you look at the statistics, all of those shows that have queer and trans people, that show is not explicitly about those individual characters. It's not about their life. It's not about their lived experience. They just happen to be there. Mm -hmm. And so if tokenizing black lives, brown lives, queer and trans lives is what you're into, great. That's perfect for you. It isn't enough for me. Yeah. So both of you are on this journey now, um, especially you, Nancy, of divesting from perfectionism. But it's a process. It's not an overnight thing. Um, where are you taking this in your work as you move forward? I know that we are at a standstill with the strikes. But when you change as a person, when, when you are not um, subscribing to this kind of thing anymore, it's gonna change the way you work, it's gonna change the way you move. I love that, because for me, the, the yes, I have lots of different works, so we were joking um, offline, I have like, I guess I have 15 jobs, I have so many different jobs, but the number one job I have, it sounds cliche, but it is to be a parent. And the best thing that has come from the very difficult 18 months I've been through is I'm breaking the cycle with my own children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my husband and I both went to Harvard. Um, you know, for when we before we had children, we got the little Harvard onesie. You know? Yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, we of do all course. that. And let me tell you, we have these conversations. We're really listening to our kid. And with my oldest in particular, I remember a, we have these very intense conversations at dinner. 
and we had planned in advance to do this because we are still perfectionists. We said, and we had this conversation, we said, you know, we don't care where you go to college. And if you don't want to go to college, that is totally fine. Mm. Like, you do what works for you. I hear somebody laughing, and just like, you don't believe that. I do believe that. Like, <laughs> or at least I'm going to fake it till I make it. <laughs> but, okay, can I just say, though, I mean, you know, being out in the world, and I'm not, you know, of course, this is um, not a stereotype, but... I have found it to be that white families are more likely to be that way with their kids. And it's just sort of a newer phenomenon for black folks to be like, you don't have to go to the best oh college. You don't even have to get all A's. Dude, like, <laughs> yes. And but my son, I didn't even know he was carrying tension because yeah. he, he, he literally was just like, well, well maybe, I'll, maybe I'll go to college for for a semester right, he's like, Dad, Mom, don't be too crazy. Yeah, no, I'm that's going great. to college. Maybe yes. it was reverse psychology. Exactly. But I'm proud. Of <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> that would make me happy. No, but I'm really excited about these conversations and that, to know that and let them know that we, we trust you. You can come up with your own path. You know, we are doing the best we can, especially with my oldest. We always tell him, we apologize for any mistakes that we have made. Yes. Because you are first, and you're rolling through this with us. I love it. <laughs> yes. So, so it's, I really have enjoyed this. It's yeah. taken a lot of stress off of my husband and I. We shall see what fruit it bears. Right. <laughs> it's an experiment. We're going to see. Stephen. Same for you. How is it, how is this, as you move through now, in these steps that you're taking in your life, how is it going to impact your work in your life? I feel like I'm, I'm walking with more clarity, which is nice. I feel like my, we were talking about this backstage, I think my 20s and my 30s were riddled with deep ambition. You know, in high school, I was vote, the superlative that I was voted was. Um, by any means necessary, most ambitious. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, love it. <laughs> yeah. That sounds Detailed. like you, though. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've let some of that energy go. Mm. You know, I feel like I can breathe. Mm -hmm. and I think that to go back to your first question about the strike, I think that's been one of the benefits of this. What for me, particularly in the last two and a half years since Pose ended, has been what I would call a fallow period. Yeah. I feel like I'm finally getting reacquainted with myself and with my art. I think that I had forgotten uh, the love of the craft, yep. you know, and it felt like I was just sort of walking by, like walking through space and time idly and not quite yeah. stopping to just take a break and assess and appreciate where I'm at. Yeah. And though the strike is terrible and I wish it was over, um, the, the beauty and the benefit of this moment for me has been to say, why do I tell story? What are the stories that I want to tell? You know, what is living in my heart? What is in the back of my throat that needs to be said loudly and proudly? And I don't know that I would have been able to get to that place had I not stopped. That's right. Stephen Canals and Nancy Red, thank you both so much. Thank you for having thank you. us. <laughs> My next guests, Jamila Lemieux and Aize Jamar Everett. <laughs> Welcome, both of you. Thank Hi. you. So we were talking about perfectionism with my last guests. And I wanted to talk with both of you all about something else. And that is, when and what do you do when you're just tired of running? And you're tired of performing this thing. And what do you do when you start to feel? Because when you stop running, when you stop like over compensating and overachieving, then you're like in that space that Stephen just talked about where now he could feel, now it's quiet. Um, and Jamila, you and I were on the phone. I was on the phone with everybody, I guess, but we were on the phone and I was talking to you about where you are in your life. 
And you know, I've, I've admired you for so long. The last decade, I would even say 15 years, you've been killing it. I mean, with your writing, with your television and radio appearances and live appearances, I mean, you've just been speaking truth to power in such a profound way. And so I was very excited to hear from you where you are. And you said, I'm kind of like in no man's land. Like, I don't know what my next steps are. Tell me where you are in this moment and why that is. Um, I had a vibrant, thriving career in media for some years, you know, and I was always running, always ripping and running, always had a suitcase, always working, you know, spending a lot of time away from my child. Um, and then something sort of happened around 2019. Well, one, I moved to LA and I moved from New York where I had this very vibrant kind of fly life to a place where I didn't know hardly anyone. Um, and, you know, everything just slowed down and then the pandemic happened and everything just stopped. So all the things I could take for granted, like speaking engagements and opportunities to get on the road just dried up and I'm in a period now where I'm sort of at a crossroads in my career and I have to figure out what do I do next? You know, like some of the things I did in the past don't really work anymore. I was big on Twitter. There's no more Twitter, yep. you know? Yep. Um, Twitter made a lot of money for me. It was great, yeah, yeah. you know, but, um, but it is a non-factor at this point. Um, so I'm really just having to sit still and figure out what is it that I would want to do. And, and I bet it's uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, there's another component to this, too, because you're writing a memoir. Yeah. And so you're in this space where you're not sure where you're going next. You're sitting in this quiet, but you're also sitting with your thoughts and you're sitting with yourself. That's pretty. That's a that is. Woo, that's a that's a place to be in, right? It can be overwhelming. Yeah, you know, um, something I've come to realize in this past year is that I don't know myself as well as I thought I did. You know, and I think most of us think we are the expert on ourselves. We know ourselves so well, but I just realized there was just so much about myself I hadn't interrogated, so mm -hmm. much I hadn't thought about and considered. You know, um, and just really trying to figure out like who I am as I tell this story. You know, I know the part of my story, the parts of my story that are interesting and made a publisher interested in acquiring the book, you know, like I got the tea, I get it, yeah. you know what I mean? But also like, who am I as a woman? Yeah. You know, who am I to put this work out in the yeah. first place? Yeah. I use a, um, right before we came on there, we had the video up talking about Truth Be Told, and there was a quote from you in there where you said, you know, I suffered from that black male thing where I'm just running. I am always running. And then you get to this moment where you stop. And when you stop, then you have to let the hurt in. You've been where Jamila has been many times, I'm guessing, but you've also worked through it. Yeah. But like once you get to that point, like how did you move through it? I let it hurt. <clears throat> Um, didn't run from the hurt. Um, I mean, I can say psychedelics, which is like a lot of um, what I utilize to look at myself in the mirror and, and get to know myself. Um, but the lessons that it gave me was like, you know, you know, you're gonna die at some point. And if I'm gonna die at some point, even the pain is a gift, yeah. right? And so if I can take the pain as a gift, then nothing can stop me. You know, it's just, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that lesson. Thank you for that knowledge. Thank you for that feeling. I don't like that feeling, but thank you for that. <laughs> you know, like, you just, like, I just, it's like, there's going to be stumbles. There's going to be breaks. Like, no, like, somebody was telling me about something, and they're like, yeah, it's so hard. And I was like, yeah, who promised you easy? Yeah. Like, who, what in this life is supposed to be easy? It's going to be a grind. But when you get it done, it's all the more valuable because it wasn't easy. You were on season five of Truth Be Told um, talking about psychedelic therapy with me, both in the recreational sense and in the therapeutic sense. As can, a, I, can, I, can I just yeah. pick up that thing? I think as African Americans in this country, black people in this country, our recreation is therapeutic. 
Yes. And there's this divide that the clinical models tend to put out there that like, well, you know, that, but like. If, say more what you mean though when you say like our recreation is there. Yeah, black joy is healing. It is so much fun. I'm a writer as well and I made a commitment. I do not write uh, trauma porn. I, you ain't gonna, right. gonna hear about the worst parts of my life. You're gonna hear about the best parts of my life. You're gonna hear about the people that I love. You're gonna hear about the people that supported me. You're gonna hear about the jokes we told. You know, <laughs> freaking everything. Like, I'm not, I'm not, it, Holly, I mean, no offense to Hollywood, I mean, it's Hollywood or whatever. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, this, this industry, they, they will put black trauma on screen, on camera, in audio, until like, the cows yeah. come home. But if you have five black men enjoying themselves on a corner, I promise you the police will be called in 2.3 seconds. Yes, yes. What's that yes. about? You yeah. know what I mean? So I'm like, my commitment to black joy is eternal and like prevalent. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering, Jamila, when you hear, um, when you hear Aize say like, he's not going to put you know, the bad things that happened to him in a book. Part of that, though, is contending with the things, though, before you can actually access and get to that. Mm -hmm. um, writing a memoir and getting to the deepest parts of yourself, how much of a challenge is that for you to, like, feel and access that? Because, like, you're probably touching on a lot of the, the deep stuff as you're getting through your memoir. It's incredibly difficult, you know. Um, interestingly enough, I think I got through some of the tough stuff early on. Like, in the earliest days of writing the book, the stuff that came out the quickest was the traumatic stuff. You know, I expected it to be otherwise. Um, I have some happy memories that are hard for me to look back on that I'm struggling to write about, you know. like, But the, the difficult stuff kind of just... It came out pretty quickly, so I was fortunate about that. And I'm lucky that I have a great therapist, and we meet once a week, you yes. know, and I have someone to, yeah, like, talk to about sharing these difficult experiences. Yeah. You know, the thing about, um, so if anyone has listened to season five of Truth Be Told, you do know that I went on my own psychedelic journey traveling to Jamaica um, for therapeutic purposes but I'm a, I'm, now that you have said, like, I'm going to stop, like, delineating between, like, therapy, what therapy, like, just the whole definition of therapy. But um, it was a life-changing experience because I was able to see myself and that whole thing that we talk about, about, like, seeing your trauma without being re-traumatized and being able to contextualize it. But I use a, like, what has happened since then, because it's been a year, is that wow, I'm seeing so many parts of myself and actually seeing parts of myself from other vantage points that maybe years ago I was very defensive about. Maybe I even had conflicts with people about these parts of myself and now I could see it from their perspective. The challenge in that is that you're constantly assessing yourself and I wanna know, had that been at any point a challenge for you? Because I'm kind of sick of myself, you know? <laughs> but are you kind to yourself? Ooh. Do you allow yourself to make mistakes? Mm. See, I don't have the disease that y'all have. I have never been a perfectionist. <laughs> I, like, like, no offense. <laughs> like, I mean, and, you know, like I used to, I mean. But I, I, mm, I challenge that with you because, like, I didn't even go through your entire, like, bio. You have like multiple degrees. Mm -hmm. You have done so many different things. You've mm -hmm. had like 10 different careers. Mm -hmm. Like you are always striving. Mm -hmm. And I've screwed up in every single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I have messed up constantly. I have, uh, I mean, I, I've been, I've been uh, <laughs> I was a drug and alcohol rehab therapist um, and I ran a, a clinic in, in Oakland at 50 kids um, sleeping there. And one time I saw, I thought I saw one kid run around the corner at two in the morning. I woke the entire house up. Yes. And I was like, who's running around? Who's doing that? Do you understand? I could have caused a riot. Yes. Like, yeah. I could have lost my life from that thing. Yeah. Right? Kids could have bounced out. Right? Yeah. I've messed up. I mean, I've messed up all the time. What's been the, my saving grace is that I have felt the spirit of forgiveness mm. descend upon me again and again and again. You mean being forgiving of yourself? No. I mean feeling the spirit of forgiveness descending upon me and saying, it's okay. Mm. It's okay to make a mistake. Mm. You screwed up. Own that. If mm. you run from it, it's going to be bad. But if you own it, 
You screwed up, Isaac. Can you, can you say, I screwed up? All right, now move forward. Because what's the worst thing that could happen? Do you fear about that? I, just, you, I stay in that screw up. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like, if I, if, I, if I held on to what I just told you about, right? Like, waking up all his kids and screwing, you know, like, you know, I, I did not have my, my I, I wasn't a therapist at that time. If I was like, okay, I'm not a good therapist because I did this one mistake. Right. Right? I wouldn't have been able to go to the next thing. When you, for me, at least, when I hold on to the hurt, I stay in the hurt. Mm -hmm. But when I allow that spirit of forgiveness to come into me, and more importantly, transfer it to other people, yep. we get to move forward. Thank you for that. Jamila, um, you know, being a truth teller as you, as you have been for so many years, um, it, comes, it comes with being a target. And I know on social media, you were pretty prolific for a long time. And then there was a moment where you were like, I'm just not gonna do it anymore. It was more than just Twitter becoming X. It was like, I'm just not gonna, gonna engage. Um, what has that meant for your mental health? I think it's been great for my mental health. Um, you know, I'm not obsessively checking an app. I'm not uh, pouring a lot of time into having conversations that were often, you know, coming from a bad faith place, even though I'm wanting to have discourse, you know, like um, I definitely got in the habit of sparring with people just to see how smart I felt. Yeah, you know, right. Like yeah. Just the art of debating with people on the internet and feeling like a winner. Um, and there are no winners in the internet debates. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I miss it. You know, I miss the engagement. I miss, you know, how many people I interacted with during that time. Um, but, you know, I don't really have a vision for what I want for myself from social media at this point. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't feel compelled by TikTok like I want to, but God, there's so many steps. So, you know, I feel I like know, a right? dinosaur. It takes a lot of work. It like. takes a lot of work, <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, but I do know that overwhelmingly it's been better for my mental health. Yeah, yeah. Before we... Um, Rap, I really want to get to an important point uh, with you, Aize. Um, you have a documentary, A Table of Our Own, which takes a look at um, psychedelic use for black people. But you also are doing, um, you're also in this space more broadly as well. And like one of the things that's been top of mind for you is like, the ability for folks, since now it's becoming more and more of a thing that is above ground, and we probably will see elements of it um, regulated, legalized, like the unscrupulous nature of so many spaces. Um, like we were just even having a talk about someone who we both know who now has been accused of horrible things. And because it's an unregulated space, because you know people are trusting of other people, like some things can happen. So I just wanted to, very quickly, if you could just talk about the ways that you recommend people um, step into it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think if folks are interested in, in psychedelics, I'd say plant medicine when I'm talking about this stuff. Um, it's the same thing, like if you have a grandma that ever wrapped a cabbage leaf around your head when you had a headache, it's in that vein. And if we start talking about psychedelics, we start talking about Ram Dass and Timothy Leary and all these other folios that, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know how the 60s went. Um, <laughs> And it's that same thing, right? It's like this like white male corporate culture that says more, 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 faster, 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 now, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. And I've never seen that as a model of health. I think go at the speed of trust. Take your time. Go slow. They say the medicine calls you. If it calls you, take your time with it. You want to take some mushrooms, why don't you try growing some mushrooms first? Mm -hmm. Right? Why don't you try take? Why don't you try talking with people about mushrooms? Why don't you talk about? Why don't you read about mushrooms? Why don't you talk to people who've already done them? Like you know, just there's a, you know what healthy speed is for you, and you also know what panic speed is for you. It doesn't make any sense to to go into this work in a sense of panic. Yeah. Go in a speed of of, of just go slow. <laughs> go slow. Slow is healthy. 
Man, that sounds like a mantra for life, like go in the speed of trust. I love it. Aize Jama Everett and Jamila Lemieux, thank you both so much. Thank you. All right, this next uh, guest, our next guest is, um, I don't even know if I even told him this before, but I like see him as like a brother. I just have such a deep soul connection to Casey Gerald. Come on out, Casey. Hey, y'all. How you I doing? took my notes. I stood in the back. I said, y'all got some good stuff. Casey, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Casey was um, a part of my very first season of Truth Be Told. Um, we like rushed your L.A. apartment. You were living in L.A. at the time. And um, one of the messages that you were giving back then that you would later write a very profound piece on was um, the black art of escape. Essentially, you say we've deployed a lot of strategies for survival in this country. Um, I'm gonna use your words, John Henryism, where we feel like we can work our way out of it, protest and rebellion. And then there is the black art of escape. Can you explain it? No. Um, I don't mean that as I, I won't explain it, um, but I can't explain it. Uh, and in part because I don't really give messages. It's, I don't really see that as my job. I try to figure out what it is I need to know for myself. And I try to find... a pleasurable way to make that accessible for someone else. That's right. To receive. Yeah. But I have no investment whatsoever in them receiving it mm -hmm. <laughs> anymore. I used to. Um, and so The Black Art of Escape, first of all, is a title of an essay I wrote in 2019 in Los Angeles. Um, once I finally let go of that man and had some free time <laughs> uh, <laughs> to do my work. Yeah. Uh, but the title is stolen actually from Invisible Man. Uh, there's a section in Invisible Man where Ellison says he was, he was well schooled in the black art of escape. Mm. And that was only the title because they wouldn't publish my original title which was Every, nigger got, every Nigger's Got a Kingdom in His Head. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which was also stolen. Yes. Uh, but from um, from uh, The Color Purple, yes, there's a great moment in The Color Purple where Celia and Mr. they have reconciled as so far as they can. And, uh, and uh, Celia is telling Mr. about the Olinka people from Africa mm -hmm. and how they would get in trouble with the colonizer because the Olinka people wanted to do their own thing right. and they would be punished severely for doing so. And uh, Mr. couldn't imagine any black people anywhere in the world living in such a reckless fashion. And he said, well, Celia, you know, every nigga got a kingdom you know. in his head. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> and isn't it true, and thank God it is, um, I felt it very important as we reached this 400-year milestone for us to think about the same question that we've always been thinking about, which is how can we live in a land that's made to kill us. It's a very juicy dilemma. Mm -hmm. And we've tried so many strategies, many of which you articulate. But what I started to find out was that there were some strategies that we've tried that have been very peculiarly hidden from us. Mm -hmm. One of which being uh, the strategy of flight, mm -hmm. which Virginia Hamilton talks about in The People Could Fly, which Toni Morrison talks about in Song of Solomon, 
uh, when uh, Milkman um, says, he says, uh, uh, Guitar says to Milkman, he says, if you want to fly, you got to let go of all that shit that's swaying you down. Mm -hmm. So what I found, having been raised in Dallas, Texas, by black people in an, a severely segregated space, um, thank God it was, uh, uh, what I found was that there were parts of our history that had been kept from us that we needed urgently to recover yeah. uh, at such a time as this so that we wouldn't keep beating our heads against the wall trying to convince a country to accept us or to see us or to like us or a country or a man or a job or whomever it may be yeah. that we can stand in wherever we are in the context of impossibility and know that our lives are at the soul level, yeah. our lives are inevitable regardless of whatever material impossibility we might encounter in day to day. So that's what you know, the essay was about, but then you get to the part of dealing with a completely morally bankrupt and uh, 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 unimaginative publishing industry and nobody wanted to publish it. Mm -hmm. Right, you, gets, were, yeah. you were talking about you're just going to publish it like where? Like you got the New Yorker to publish it. Well, I got New York Magazine to publish it and pay me a few pennies for it, and that was fine because uh, after I'd gotten six or seven rejections uh, from folks, I didn't worry at all. I prayed and I cried a little bit, I will confess to that. But I prayed and I came off real clear that I would just post it on Tumblr. Right. Because again, my job is not to give anybody anything. It's not to force anybody to have anything. It's to try to be available. Uh, Lucille Clifton once said, these poems w wanted to be written and I was available. My, all my job is on a daily basis is to be available. And if I'm available and I receive it and I try to put it down as truthfully and beautifully as possible, whoever needs to get it will get it, even if it's a thousand years from now. That's not my concern, but I was happy to put it on Tumblr. I was happier that they published it. Right, right. Of course. <laughs> you know, to be clear. But, you know, I talk cash, cash money shit, you know, until, right. until things hit the fan. The thing is, you wrote it and you were, you were a lot of places talking about it. Mm -hmm. And then you, you basically disappeared. Where did you go? I haven't even seen you since then. It was, it, it's like you even disappeared on, on social. You disappeared. You escaped, I felt like. Well, you look great now that we see each other again. And hopefully I haven't aged too poorly. You look the same, uh, exactly. You know, <laughs> um, I've never disappeared to myself. Yeah. So... I don't, I have not registered my life as, an, as a disappearance. I've registered my life as a profound and, and delicious homecoming. This is what I write. This is exactly it. Because you wrote this profound piece, The Black Art of Escape, which basically is like, right, every, every, I can't say it, okay, I'm a public radio That's right. host That's right. now. That's right. So I'm not going to say it on here. Yeah. But every inn has a kingdom in his own head. Yes. This, this is at the root of the black art of escape. And so you decided that you, after being everywhere, you, you were going to come back to your home, which is in you. Well, I mean, I've done many things aside from that, you know. I, I did. I loved uh, the conversation about psychedelics. I went out to the desert in far west Texas and you know, uh, and did that. So I've done many things. I've, you know, I've written, How I've tried this? to love, I've tried to, I've tried to be a good brother to my sister. I've tried to be a good uncle. I've done a great number of things. I did, uh, you know, I became a writer to save my life. I had lived uh, America from the very bottom to the very top. You know, I was born, you know, my mother suffered from mental illness, disappeared when I was 13. My father struggled with drug addiction, was gone when I was very young. You know, I grew up this poor, queer, damn near orphan in the forgotten world of Oak Cliff, Texas. And somehow, out of that uh, uh, forgotten world, somebody came and pulled me out and sent me to Yale and to play football to play and football. then to, yeah. to Harvard Business School and did all these things. And they told me, hey, you've made it. And I was really cracked up. Yeah. <laughs> so right. I didn't know that that's what making it was going to be. Uh, and so I had lived myself into a dead end around 29 Okay, and I became a writer just to try to write myself out. Yeah. So what I've been interested in 
is uh, a body of work that is far more difficult, I have found, than any of the things they told me I was supposed to strive to do at Yale or Harvard Business School. It's a very difficult thing to love somebody, in my experience. It's a very difficult thing to sit and try to forgive your mother and yes. your father. It's a very difficult thing. My sister, who's supposed to be my big sister, um, which means if I'm the baby, I don't have to do anything. Right. So then, you know, it's a very difficult yeah. thing to get, and we're now in our 30s, and she's in her early 40s, and I am in a moment of intense work, but also my sister needs me. And so that is, that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to live a life that I will be proud of, and I also have been trying to live the life that my soul came into this lifetime to live, mm. not the life that some fool at Yale said was, you know, successful. Thing about that message is like, that is the same message you were giving. You were giving us, but so many of us couldn't hear it. And I, I really do think that it was also the time period we were in. So I, if we just put ourselves back in that time of 2019, um, a year later than George Floyd would be murdered. And I think that the quietness of the pandemic allowed us to hear ourselves. It allowed us to be able to actually sit within mm -hmm. and hear those messages that we hadn't heard or we, we were running for so long and in this world of this John Henryism for so long, we weren't able to really hear those messages. So like we're 2023 and I'm hearing you and I'm like, oh, I'm now where you were in 2019. But it's all good. Yes. There's no rush for anything. You know, we all are, and this is why I swear by psychedelics, I would hope you would do it in, in um, my brother's uh, very directed and intentional way and not, you know, my yes. way out in the West Texas desert. But, <laughs> you know, uh, do it. Hey. Well, well, do it when you can because the broader perspective is so important at this time. If all you feel is true is what you see and what you hear and what they've told you is the world, uh, then you're missing a whole hell of a lot of stuff. And you're also going to be very stressed out. Yeah. Uh, and so when I say it's all good, I mean it's all good. Uh, if you don't get the lesson this lifetime, there are many other lifetimes you can get it. It's mm. fine. You get it when you need it. You get it when you're ready. I see my sister with the head wrap. I've been spending time the past few months with, um, with Erica Badu. And, you know, she talks about writing Baduism in... Uh, uh, 1997, 96, 95, and writing it for her child, and writing it for her child's peers, and uh, you know you, the the job of that a person like that, or those of us who consider ourselves vessels, is again be available, put the thing on the record, put it on the page, put it whatever, and put the little stone down on the trail, put the little breadcrumb down on the trail, and whenever that person who's lost on that path passes it and looks down and finds it, that's good, that's mm. great. Mm. And if they don't get it, the birds will get it. If the birds don't get it, it'll decay. Right. It's not that big a deal, right, it's right. all fine. You know, it's all good. It's all good. And I'm sober, completely. <laughs> And I know it because I'm looking at you, right? I'm looking right <laughs> in your eyes. My eyes are clear. Your yeah. eyes are I'm clear. I'm tired, but I'm sober. But you're sober. You know, one thing um, I've heard you say many times is that you don't believe that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, but you believe that we're their greatest hope. I just, I find that so powerful because I always also felt like that other thing was also so powerful. Mm. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I'll tell you a story that happened recently here in Los Angeles. Uh, and I apologize in advance for getting emotional because it's something I have not talked about publicly. Um, but I started earlier this year uh, uh, a um, set of s a series of sessions with a hypnotherapist uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, Akiko. And uh, part of what we do together is uh, sort of past life regression analysis, and we do ancestral yeah. uh, work. work. And our first session, you know, you do a few cycles over the course of a few hours, and our first session, she led me uh, through sort of a moment 
where, and I'm aware, I don't know if anyone here has done hypnosis, but you know, you're aware, it's not like in the movies where you're a zombie, you know, it's like, you know, you are, you know what's going on, even though you're aware that there are other things happening in and through you. And so, you know, there came a point in our session where she uh, helped me envision a tree, and the tree had these extraordinary roots, and around the roots and around the tree were so many of my ancestors mm. who I didn't know, okay? And almost suddenly, I can't even describe it, almost suddenly I was in a very dark room and I, it was a bit like a shack and there was a woman who I knew immediately was a woman that I had first written about in The Black Art of Escape, who was my grandma, grandfather's great-grandmother, Amanda Oliver. You just Oliver. knew it, right, yes. I just knew it, yep. uh, because I kept getting these hits from Ancestry.com, we yeah. have a new, we have a new, and, and, and it turned out that three or four years later, Ancestry.com had found some marriage record of this woman with this man who I had never heard of, okay? So we're in this room, and she's having what seemed to me to be, um, kind of a traumatic event, a kind of a, a psychotic break of sorts, and she's not aware of what's happening. She's weeping, and she's holding a child, and you can tell that she believes the child is dead, and I don't know what to do, and so Akiko's trying to guide me through this moment, and I know who she is, and I know I have to be here mm. with her, mm. and I know I have to figure out in the moment why it is I'm here and what it is I'm supposed to do here. Right. And it's going so Roughly, and Akiko says something that whenever I hear it, I feel uh, such gratitude. Uh, Akiko said, um, she has a very soft voice. She said, oh, she's been stuck here for a long time. Mm. So I just sat with her, you know. And eventually, uh, Akiko helped me uh, try to convey some sense of light into the space because it was so dark, you know, and to try to help her get a sense that the baby was not dead. And eventually, there was a knock at the door of this little shack. And I opened the door. And it was the man who I'd just gotten the census hit on, who years after I had found her on the census record, she married, Booker. And he opens the door and he hugged me, almost as if to say, thanks for holding it it till I got here. Yeah, right. So I say that to say, when I, when I, uh, So powerful, Casey. When I wrote that line, this is why we should stop explaining everything. Mm. When I wrote that line, I had no idea what it meant. I just knew it was true. And it took four years and a hell of a lot of work for you, to- for me to be available yep. for the understanding. Mm. So and I know that I've only scratched the surface. Mm. So when I say we are our ancestors' greatest hope, I don't mean uh, they need us to go and be on Good Morning America because they were not represented in the media. Mm. That is such an impoverished vision Mm. of what this whole exercise is about. When I say we are our ancestors' greatest hope, I mean that all throughout this galaxy and beyond, on many timelines, there are many versions of ourselves and those who have made us possible, who are waiting for us to be available for some interaction that they need to get unstuck, Mm -hmm. or they need to finish the story they were trying to tell, or they need to Who knows? So that's what I know of what I mean, although what I know more is that I'll keep on knowing what there is to know about what I've said. Yes, yes. And what 
somebody means. Thank you for... Um, Sorry for all that. I really didn't. No, no. Didn't thank you for that. See, powerful. No. It, it is so powerful. Um, because so much is, is also nonverbal and knowing. And when you're so separated from yourself, that ability to be able to even hear enough and trust yourself enough to be in that knowing space, I... I look at you, Casey, and I just feel so much energy from you in a positive way because I can feel the, you and the knowing of yourself, that you are rooted and sitting in that. And that's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's why we're having this conversation tonight. You had a chance to listen to everyone that we talked to. Um, we went from like divesting from perfectionism to like what to do when you're in that place where you're, you, you stopped running and now you're starting to feel. And now we're here with you saying like, sit in it, that inner self and trusting that inner voice. What is your takeaway for tonight after hearing everyone else? My takeaway is I'm so glad you all are alive. Uh, There's a great moment in another country, James Baldwin's novel, and the protagonist, spoiler, it commits suicide 100 pages into the book. It happens in New York, though that's a very Los Angeles kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and they have his funeral, and he was a Harlem Pentecostal, you know, and so it's a very difficult eulogy to give, and the minister gives this great sermon. He says, you know, um, they say a man that takes his own life on be buried in holy ground. I don't know nothing about that. All I know is all the ground God made is holy, and I'll tell you something else. I know a lot of people who took their own lives, and they're walking the streets today. Mm. And some of them are preaching the gospel, and some are sitting in the seats of the mighty. And if there weren't so many dead folks walking around, maybe those of us trying to live wouldn't have to suffer so bad. So, you know... When I say I'm glad you all are alive, I mean that at a very deep level. So all I've heard tonight was people trying to figure out how to live yeah. with a capital L, yeah. how to be well, how to raise their children, how to love their partners, how to hear themselves, how to love that little version of themselves that was abandoned, that was ignored, that was neglected, that was punished for that mistake that led to that thing, or that worked so hard to make that thing really good and nobody paid attention, you know? Um, that sounds like freedom to me. It's all good. It really is all good. Uh, so I heard people who have the great privilege you know, we all are living in a tradition. Every time I get mad, and I've been fighting all day with magazine people, and I just want to, uh, <laughs> you know, get on the next flight to New York and burn it all down, you know. Um, but I'm always reminded that I'm working in a tradition where Frederick Douglass would be killed for writing. Yeah. Sonia Sanchez, many years later, was run out of homes and jobs for writing. writing. What, was, what we now, 50 years later, say is the truth. There's been such an enormous price uh, that has been paid for us to sit here and cry openly mm -hmm. and make up things to say and yes. search for answers and hug each other and shake each other's hand and have clean water, you know. So that's the takeaway. The takeaway is that um, as Reverend Foster said further on in that eulogy, all the try, all who try must suffer. But yeah. the trying is still worth it. And Life so that's suffering. what I've heard. Life is suffering. Well, it's suffering in one way. But, you know, it's, um, I mean, I don't know. Is it really, is, is that really all there is? I, I don't think, think like so. I think going back to, no, and that is not what I mean. Like going back to what Ayize said is like, sitting in the hurt and feeling it and saying, this is part of life, it's all good. This is, suffering is a part of life. Saying thank you. 
Yes. Uh, you, you say thank you because there's something in that moment of contrast. Yep. That, because your soul can handle anything. I remember I was really f trying to love this, and it was hard, my God. And I said, I told my therapist, I said, Robert, how much can I take of this? You know, I was just so outdone. And he said, well, you, your soul can take anything. The question is, how much can Casey take? <laughs> mm -hmm. So all we're trying to do, and that's why I love that Shrooms conversation. That's why I love this. That's why I love reconnecting with people a few years out at a time. Yeah. Because you see that we're all on this very interesting uh, track where you, our soul, is way down the line. And Casey or Tanya or Steven or whomever, we're at the starting line and we're running and sometimes we give up and we sometimes say, go to hell and you know, but the, it's all waiting there. And so I, I find that if we can reframe the pain, first off, we, if we can stop doing stupid stuff that we know is gonna make us suffer, let's just mm. put it, let's just be real about that. Um, so, you know, uh, that's a whole other conversation. But that aside, um, if we can put into context our unpleasant experiences as beautiful gifts that help us get closer to the life we've come to live, yes. then that's where we can say it's all good. I'm not talking about toxic positivity uh, that's immature and, and dangerous. I'm talking about a broader perspective on what this whole adventure is about. Man, I love you, Casey. I love you too, I really do. Yes. And now I kind of know what it means. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, before we open it up for questions and bring everyone back up. There's also like a lot of news going on with you. You said all of the beautiful things happening to you, but like professionally, you get, tell us the latest news. You've got some news. Your people told us. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, uh, I guess, you know, I don't sign embargoes and all that things. So I say, what are you talking about? Um, but no, I recently um, came chairman of the board of a, company called Kickstarter, um, which is very exciting for me uh, because, you know, Kickstarter has been around almost 15 years, and at base, um, it was founded by Perry Chen, who was just a, you know, kid in New Orleans who wanted to throw a concert and didn't have any money. Yeah. And so he said, well, what if the people who would come to the concert paid for the concert before it happened? <laughs> And we'll call it crowdfunding. And you know, here we are all these years later. And what so many of us experience is um, how hard, if not impossible, it is to do the creative work mm -hmm. that we're here to do and keep it free, keep it true, keep it accessible to people. And so it means a great deal to me to be able to help steward a company that one has a mission that we all need at the forefront at this time, um, but also that is committed to being a good company mm. and not being rapaciously capitalistic and not making the bottom line the main story. You know, there's so much more to what we're doing and so I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I think at this time, all of us who are artists and creators have to be, and that's what I think, that's why I love where we started with the strike, and I'm on strike now, <laughs> you know, as well as a writer. I've as got a, writer, a yeah. project that is frozen, and you know, who knows what will happen on the other end. It may be dead, but again, you know, I tell my, you know, tax person, next lifetime I'll pay the taxes if they can't <laughs> right. get the project done, you know. But no, um, right now it's so important that we are at the helm of the creative industries, not at the mercy of the creative industries, and if anything, uh, that my tenure as chair of Kickstarter can do, I hope is for all of us. That's why I love when you called me and I said, and you said, Casey, I own the show. I said, get out of town. Yes. I love that because it's not about being uh, the black Nelson Rockefeller. That is such a bankrupt vision for what we're doing. What it is is about us owning our work us making sure that our work and the work of other people is possible, us setting examples that we don't have to exploit people to make that work happen right. and to make a living and to feed our families. So there's so much that we all can do, not just with Kickstarter, but in everything we do to make um, this world more equitable and to put more good stuff uh, into the atmosphere like mm. this experience that you've done tonight. So I'm so grateful. Well, congratulations, Casey. I'm happy for you. 
And can you give Casey a round of applause? Thank you. I want to um, thank LAist for having us tonight and for um, having me um, and opening up this space for me to be able to have these types of conversations with you. I also want to thank APM Studios and all of the folks that have worked alongside me, including all of the producers for Truth Be Told and um, many of my other endeavors. And I want to thank you, the audience. Again, it, it's tremendous to have folks say, we want to hear you talk. We want to hear what you think. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor. It is a truly an honor. So we're going to open it up to uh, questions. Um, we will have uh, folks on the mic uh, with the mic over here to the right and to the left. Just raise your hand if you have a question. And um, I hope you've thought of some good things to ask. And we're going to have the rest of our uh, lovely wise ones come on stage. And can we give Tanya a huge hand? All right, questions. Raise your hand if you have any or one. Yes. So hi. Um, I guess my question for each of the panelists is what can we do tomorrow to make your kingdom happen as oh. soon as possible? Wow. What a question. Thank you. What's your name? Oh, I'm... My name is Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, for your question. Who's going to come on now? Let, let's just start with Casey. Come on. Um, well, my account number is 8536. No, but really, you know, um, I want to say something, and I don't mean it in any kind of way. Uh, any kind of nasty way at all. Um, if my perspective is that if my kingdom or any of our kingdom, whatever that means, um, is real and is what we have been led to feel it is, then there's nothing you can do or not do to stop it. That's one of the more important things, I think, for us to gather. Um, and it kind of takes the pressure off everybody. Mm -hmm. And it takes the pride off everybody, too. Um, and so I would say that, and then I'd say you get real still and whatever it is in your home, and you meditate, and you, you know, have some conversations with the voice or voices inside of you, and you'll know exactly what to do. Thank you for that. Aize. Um, I'm not in a rush, so it doesn't happen to happen tomorrow. I don't believe in royalty. I stay humble. I stay to the ground. I don't need a kingdom. I need community. I think that one thing is really fun and good when we want to do things, because it's exciting that you get riled up, is um, in one's own community and thinking about one's own gifts. So I can't necessarily tell you what to do because I don't know what your capacities are. But one thing that's helped me a lot when I'm feeling like I want to do something is to think about what gifts do I have to offer? Like what knowledge do I have? How can I sponsor someone? So I suggest that that, and then whenever you see someone, it could be someone you don't know out in these streets, you know, someone that you do know, that you interact with, say, how, can I help you in this way? These are some skills that I have to offer. Do you need them? You know, and I think that's a really great way all of us in our communities can really build bridges. I would just say listen to black women. Mm. Period. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're here tonight because you do that, obviously. So that's a good thing. Keep keep listening to black women. Um, I think I'm still building, so I can't say what I need um, for my own. But I'm thinking of, I'm referencing a friend who um, would often talk about should use lawns as a metaphor, and I think what's important is to cultivate your own lawn ethically and with morals and integrity. 
I love it. Questions? More questions? Yes, we have someone up at the front here. Uh, yes. Is A mic is coming to you, Herman. Thank you. My name is Herman. I want to thank you for putting this panel together. But I came this evening primarily to ask you if you would elaborate on your, about your experience in Jamaica. I was so impressed with your conversation with, with, with Terry Gross. And then I started listening to your podcast, and I've been trying to figure out I'm 76, I'm retired, and I'm changing life, and I'm trying to figure out what it's all about. Mm. And so when I heard you talk about your experience in Jamaica and meeting your grandmother and stuff, I said, oh, I have to talk to this lady. And so you said tonight it was a life-changing experience. And so if you wouldn't mind, just for me, forget the rest of them, <laughs> <laughs> just, just elaborate on that so I can go home and say, OK, this is where I'm going. Oh, wow, Thank you. yes. Oh. Well, Herman, thank you so much um, for listening to the podcast, and thank you so much for your question. You know, um, when I say that my trip in Jamaica was a life-changing experience, I think a lot of what you heard tonight with the other panelists and the way that they're thinking about themselves and listening to themselves and learning different parts of themselves and just, just living it's so profound to be given the gift of being able to see yourself clearly because it allows you, it allows me to understand my place in the world and my purpose. And it was also life changing for me because I was able to have more compassion for the people around me. I went home to Detroit a few weeks ago for my grandmother's 97th birthday and my entire family was there. And that was a big deal because there's been a lot of family dysfunction. And over the years, people have fallen off. There have been many times that I haven't seen people for many years, and then we come back together for big events. But it's always a little strained, and maybe there's a fight by somebody at the end. Somebody's going to act up. But we were all there for my grandmother, and we were all sitting there for three whole days. There wasn't a fight, there wasn't an argument, and there was an earnest try. But like by the third day, I was like, what is this? Wow, like uh, there's, everyone's like on this path? And then I realized it's really me. And I do think that Obviously, people came on their best behavior because to celebrate a 97-year-old person's birthday is an amazing thing. But I also saw like my reactions to um, people. My sense of empathy had grown, and I, I was able to see all of them a, a lot clearer. I could see their pain. And so I had a lot more compassion. That was a great gift, and it's, that's the life-changing part of it. But the last thing I'll say about it is um, I'm gaining insights every day still. It happened a year ago, and right after it happened, I could like tell you all the things that were life-changing. And then six months later, you know, I'm, I'm seeing all of these other things. And then a year later, I'm still learning, and I'm still learning about myself. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but as Aize said, you know, if you're truly interested, the things that you're doing right now, asking questions, listening to people's stories, doing your own research, sitting with yourself and knowing yourself, whether you decide to ever take that journey or not, that is a wonderful exercise to take because you'll learn a lot more from, about something you didn't know and then you'll learn more about yourself. Thank you, Herman, for your question. Yes, we have a question up here. A mic is coming to you. Thank you. My name is David. I so appreciate your, your comments on this panel tonight. One of the themes that I've been hearing as I've been listening to each of you is really uh, comes around the, the concept of allowing. So, you know, allowing the perfectionism maybe not to run our lives. And Isaiah, I so appreciate what you said about um, taking your time. And uh, Casey, you, you just, you are in a rhythm 
that I, that, it, that is just fascinating to me, and I, I see so much value in in your being. And so my wife and I, we run a business, and there's a there's a drivenness. You know, there's payroll due every two weeks, and there's you know there's there's goals, and there's a drive there, and there's a reward to that drive, but there's a cost to it too. And so as I'm listening to th these various themes tie together, the question that I would pose to you is how do we contend with the fact that as much as I would love to take my time, the external circumstances have an urgency to them. Yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, there's, there's acknowledging that and kind of wanting to have it both ways. So that's my question. Thanks for your question. I believe um, that there is a cost to that expediency. Um, and I wonder if you feel it in your body. All the time. Yeah. And I wonder how healthy that is. And I wonder when you think about your organization, your business, are you spreading, is it a healthy business? And not in the sense of does it just make money, right? I, you look pretty successful. I'm hoping it's making money, <laughs> right? <laughs> But do the people that you interact with, are, are they healthy, right? Are your interactions with your employees healthy, whole interactions? You know, this, this capitalist system is not designed to have people in mind, right? We are cogs, we are, we are what we do, not who we are, right? And what happens when we slow down and allow people to be fully human? Maybe it means more days off. Maybe it means more sick days. Maybe it means more days, more time thinking about something instead of doing something, right? I have to believe in my heart of hearts that there is a way to have healthy community and good business. And I'm not a businessman, right? Um, I don't know all the models, and maybe the model's not out there yet, but wouldn't that be a good project? Right, like maybe that's where, maybe that's your work, right? How do we make this business as healthy as we can make it, as well as profitable? And if it's a cost, if it's a choice between being more profitable and less healthy, right? Then you get to make that decision. Thank you. Thank can you. Can I add one real quick thing on that? Because I, I, I we got to spend some time together because I want to get on your program from where I am as a Capricorn. And uh, <laughs> there you go. OK, I love Libras. There we go. Um, I see it somewhat differently. Not differently. I see it. I contend with it. I like that word. I contend with it um, in some other ways in my life. And it kind of gets to this conversation we had earlier about perfectionism. Um, I don't ever want to let go of the standard of excellence that was um, that was inculcated in me by the poor and working class black women who raised me, who made me stand in their parlor until I could speak without stumbling over my words. <laughs> and it wasn't because they wanted me to be white. We had no interest in being white. Um, and so I think the question for me is one, why is it that you're being driven to be perfect or to win this thing. There are some things that I want to absolutely crush because I am consumed by making it great. Tanya is consumed, all of us here, you know, we're con there is something that is worth being consumed, even if it's just loving your child. That's, that's all good. Um, and so I've come to think of life not as a marathon or a sprint, but sometimes it's a series of sprints with some breaks, and that's okay. I've been writing a book called The Great Refusal, and it was sparked by Simone Biles' withdrawal from the Olympics in 2021. Now everybody, if you just stop the story there, you say, wow, she really quit. How in the hell does she do something like that? Well, no, actually, she reconstituted herself, which mm -hmm. we all must do. And she came back a different person, and she still is lethal, and she still is gonna win. <laughs> so it's, you know, it doesn't have to be either or, but I think, what I love about where you go with it is it pulls us out of where we've been conditioned to be all the time. And that's really helpful for me. Thank you for your question. Thank you. More questions? 
y'all gonna make me ask more questions? <laughs> yes. We have ours. Joanna. Hello, my name's Joanne. I just dropped my phone. Um, this is incredible. Like, just thank you. A question that I had was around children. So this is really kind of like for the parents and aunties, uncles amongst you. How do we help our kids be free? Mm. Love that question. Thank you, Joanne. We were just talking about that earlier. Nancy or Jamila? Um. Yeah. Wow, it's a struggle. Um, and I've always said that I'm striving to raise a free black child, that I want her to feel free in her body and free in the world as much as possible. You know, um, I think the best thing you can try to do is to pour into them and give them the confidence to be free. You know, make them feel good about themselves. Tell them that they're worthy. Tell them that they're beautiful. Tell them that they're smart. Tell them that they're capable. You know, um, bolster their self esteem as much as you possibly can so they don't feel encumbered by the idea of inherent mediocrity, you know, or inherent deficiency, that they feel like they're capable of things. <laughs> I grapple with this a lot. And until, again, the last 18 months, I was just on autopilot. And freedom wasn't really a part of my language. It was, I, I wasn't even thinking about it as a binary, free or unfree. It was just like, successful or not successful. Um, and the last 18 months, I've had to do a lot of reflection and a lot of looking back in my family history and talking to my mother a lot. One of the, one of the benefits of living in a hospital for four months with, in one room, she get to talk a lot. And you cherish that talking because that is a whole lot better than when they're not talking. And so you talk as much as you can and, and everything becomes such a sponge and you're listening for the first time, well I was for the first time in my life, like actually listening to what my mom was saying. And I would talk to her about how she met my father. And I've heard the story a million times but I never really listened to it until um, this year. And she was a first grade school teacher in rural Virginia in the 60s in a segregated school in the town that she grew up in, and she loved it. And she was um, 28. At that time, that was like, oh, <laughs> you may as well be like 50. <laughs> and so all of her friends had like teenagers, you know, and so, um, and she just, she said the right person just never came along. And um, one day she was just in the street and this man just shot up to her. And he said, you, are you Amanda? I've been trying to meet you. And they go out on one date, and on that one date, you know, he grew up extraordinarily um, impoverished. And he had the bravado of someone who had a goal. And he says, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire. And I'm going to make you a stay-at-home woman, and I'm going to make enough money to insulate our children from racism. And my mom was like, sold. I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, I don't care, like, what it is. And uh, he went after the school. And he accomplished it on a technical level. You know, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and he did all this incredible stuff. But to the point where, by ironically, the time um, that I was in, when he became 40, he was so exhausted, he was so broken, that my mom was very worried. She, she loved him. She didn't love the stuff, she loved him, but we didn't have the language in the 80s. And he was always working, always working, always gone, she would go on trips with her family, and there was a trip that she had planned, and at the last minute, it was, you know, it was cars back then, like you had a car, you had your stuff in it, it was packed, you had it down to the T. He decided he didn't want to work, and he wanted to come on the trip, and this was very weird for him. And so my mom was like, but there's, there's no space, I don't, I don't know how you'd fit in. And he just said, he's like, I haven't enjoyed anything. I don't get to enjoy any of this. And at the time, my mom didn't think about it, but over the next few months, things got a little more complicated. And um, my mom and people who loved him suggested he go to a psychiatrist. And in the 80s, that is anathema. I mean, you, this is like, it's, you have to understand, for a black man who is at the top of his game, to suggest one goes to a psychiatrist, it could not be worse. So on the day he was supposed to go, instead, um, he chose to die by suicide. Mm. So my entire family was upended and a person who had the most loftiest of goals to, to reach for freedom for his family and who accomplished them on a technical level 
never got to fully enjoy them. I did not really understand any of this until this year. Welcome to my journey. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the hospital, and my mother, who, she was a stay-at-home mom. Then she had to bring the business back, and she's sitting here sick, and she's just like, you know, um, I remember burying your father, and then, the, you know, having a Sunday, and then the next day going to the bank. And I am this little black woman, it's a whole bunch of white men. <laughs> They're like, where's our money? <laughs> she's just like, oh my God. And she made it happen without even breaking a sweat. And when I think about with my children, fast forward, right? Because now I'm a mom. And now I realize, oh my God, there's a whole lot to this parenting game. Because she's always just like, I love doing it. It's what, I, it's what I did for you. It's what I did for you. And I was free. I had a very free childhood. <laughs> the, only, the only responsibility for me was to be excellent. And is that freedom? Who knows, right? So I had the burden, unbeknownst to me, subconsciously, to take advantage of all of the freedom that so many people had literally and theoretically died and lost their lives for. So when I look at my kids, now that I have this awareness, before a tragedy, you know, I'm very lucky my mom survived, I survived, barely. <laughs> um, I get to kind of have what my ancestors have not had which is an opportunity to say, hold the phone, let's actually unpack all this. So when we're talking about how do we raise children to be free, again, it's back to what I said about how well do you want to know me? How well do I want to know myself? And how well do you want to actually know me? Which is why a year and a half ago, had she called me and asked me to be this panel, I think, oh my gosh, yes, let's talk about the importance of like just getting it all together yes. and going after our goals and teamwork, making the dream work. She was like, I was, I was just like, I'm tired of being perfect. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I suggest that all of us, before it's too late, really look at the things in our lives, in our family's lives, make those amends, just come to terms with what's important to you and give it your best to work on it because this is your chance, this is why you're here, because you're curious. You really wanna know how to figure it out and it starts with this, and it starts with listening, it starts with asking questions, growing the mushrooms, growing the relationships, <laughs> listening to black women, yes. supporting all kinds of media, and, and, and just being open and honest. Thank you for that, and thank you so much for sharing about your mom. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Yes, hello. Oh, hi, Brandon. <laughs> One? Okay. Yes. Um, Casey and I went to college together and haven't seen each other in of course maybe 15 years, which is wild, but oh anyway. Oh, my God. Um, I, as you know, Tanya, have had a long history with psychedelics, um, recreationally and therapeutically. Um, I'm now framing it that way. Um, but I did my first like guided psilocybin journey a couple months ago and it was a like deeply transformative foundational experience especially around sort of racial trauma and that and there's a lot to sort of say there but what I one of the things I came out with and this was partially in response to the season of truth be told was how do we proliferate the benefits of psychedelics for black people without falling into the capitalist sort of constraints of like centers and the medical industrial complex. And um, I just, I don't see the, I want, I want to know more about what that path might look like from our friends. Thank you, Brandon. This one was made for me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say Jack about the kids, but. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, you bring up an excellent point. Um, I am so fortunate that I run with the crew in Oakland of black therapists, black spiritual leaders, black business people, um, black growers who are all involved in the psychedelic movement. And as a therapist myself, as a theologian myself, what I can say is there is a fundamental difference between doing this work in a clinical, AKA white setting and around all black people. Can I swear? Go for, go, go for it. The shit just hits different. <laughs> it's just 
different, right? Um, and so I like to think of, and I know people have, have church damage, and, and that's fine, but I like to think of the church model, right? So like, you, you know, right now it's like, you're the patient, I am the therapist, I'm, you're going to lay down on a coach, couch. I say it's the position of death, actually. You're laying down on a couch, they put a blindfold on you, they play some weird classical music, they give you a certain dosage, they ask you about your mother, you start crying, you start wanting to, you know, throw up, and then, right, it's this, it's this medical model, you are sick, right? And you must be cured, right? I'm gonna tell a story. You get a bunch of black people together, and even a bunch of black queer people together. I'm sorry. Okay, so there's one time there were some people, myself included, that were in a psychedelic space together, and folks were like, were were feeling this like you know like one person was like, oh, I'm 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 just I'm feeling like I I got I got baggage. I've got so much baggage, and I'm like, okay, like let's let's talk. About, I got I feel like I got baggage in my trunk, and I'm like, you mean like like on your body or, or metaphysically? She's like, no, I have trash in my trunk, <laughs> in the trunk of my car <laughs> is my ex's stuff that I have been carrying around for nine months mm -hmm. trying, like, trying to get it back to them. Mm. And we were like, you've been carrying this around for nine months? Oh, yeah. They don't, hey, you know what we're gonna do right now? We're gonna throw that stuff away. <laughs> I don't mean metaphorically. I mean, we opened the trunk, we got some garbage bags, we took that stuff and we threw it away. You can't do that in a clinical setting. Yes. You can't do it in a clinical setting, right? And we're sitting there and there's some of us, I'm, I have to say I'm the oldest person in this whole thing. I'm tripping out about that, but I'm gonna let it go. But, <laughs> You know, me and one of the older folks, we're, we're talking about it and we're like, this, this space, this feels so familiar to us, this psychedelic space, what is this? And I was like, you know what? This is the club. This is what the club was to us. It was a place where we altered our consciousness and we moved mm -hmm. and we felt each other. And I put on George Michael's Freedom. And for those of you that were not in New York, when George Michael's Freedom came on, let me tell you something. Everybody came out yes. when George Michael's Freedom, if you were the straightest person in the world, you came out <laughs> when George Michael's Freedom came on. And we put that on and it was like, oh yes, this is familiar. And so the thing I wanna say is that this plant medicine, the psychedelics, whatever you wanna call it, it is not new to us. This, it is us. We have systems for dealing with this and being with this, but we have been told that we are, we are not supposed to do it. We are told that it is savage. We are told that it is heathenistic. It is told that like, you know, only, you know, you can only do it in the jungle, right? You can only do it in Africa. You can only do it in the, but we, but this, this striving to alter our consciousness and to form connection and to move our bodies and to feel freedom we have been doing this because this is us. So I like the church model, which says you come and sometimes you're gonna take the medicine. Sometimes you're gonna hold space for other people. Sometimes you're gonna cook. Sometimes you're gonna prepare people for the journey. Sometimes you can prepare the medicine, right? Every, you're involved no matter what, but it's not that capitalistic Here's the money, here's the thing, I take it, boom, boom, I feel better, that's the end of it. It's, it's in community, right? And so, and, and I will tell you, there's a documentary, A Table of Our Own, atableofourown.org. You can see what happens when people, when black people in community who know about medicine are together. I'll tell you something, we are the medicine. Aize Jama Everett, Stephen Canals, Jamila Lemieux, Nancy Red, and Casey Gerald. Thank you so much for spending this evening with me and with us. And thank you to the audience. Have a good night. Yeah.